Welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's Open Mind program. I'm Vicki Goodman, and it is my honor to introduce today's featured speaker, Dr. Kay Redfield Jameson, esteemed professor, psychologist, world-renowned expert on bipolar disorder, and author of groundbreaking books such as A Unquiet Mind and Touched with Fire. Dr. Jameson is joining us from her home in Sparks, Maryland, outside of Baltimore, to talk about her critically acclaimed new book, Fires in the Dark, Healing the Unquiet Mind, with her esteemed colleague, friend, and great friend of the Friends of Semmel, Dr. Michael Gitlin, Distinguished Professor of Clinical Psychiatry and Director of the Mood Disorders Clinic at UCLA. We are honored to welcome back both of our esteemed scholars who have been featured speakers at many Open Mind programs. We're very grateful to them for taking the time from their busy schedules to educate us about the age old quest for relief from psychological pain and the role of the exceptional healer in the journey back to health. Just a little side note, um, Dr. Gitlin, and to illustrate how dedicated Dr. Gitlin is, he has COVID miraculously for the first time, but he did not want to disappoint us. So instead of zooming in from his office at UCLA, where his Wi-Fi is very reliable, he's joining us from his home where he tells us the Wi-Fi can get glitchy. So please bear with us if it does do that, which we hope it doesn't. So to continue, Dr. Kay Redfield Jameson is the Dalio Professor in Mood Disorders and a Professor of Psychiatry at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine, as well as an Honorary Professor of English at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. She is the co-author of the Standard Medical Text on Bipolar Disorder. In addition to the two books I previously mentioned, is also the author of Night Falls Fast, Exuberance, and Robert Lowell, Setting the River on Fire, that was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Dr. Jameson is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. She is the recipient of numerous prizes, including the John T. and Catherine T. MacArthur Fellowship, often referred to as the Genius Grant. Dr. Michael Gitlin, in addition to being a distinguished professor of clinical psychiatry at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and director of the Mood Disorders Clinic at the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital, he is the director of the Dev adult division in the Department of Psychiatry, interim director of the geriatric division in the Department of Psychiatry, and the medical director of the Neuropsychiatric Behavioral Health Services. He's the author of numerous books, including The Clinician's Guide to Mood Disorders and The Psychotherapist's Guide to Psychopharmacology, just to name a few. For those of you with us for the first time, the Open Mind Lecture and Film Series brings together thought leaders in science and culture for relevant and meaningful discussions about mental health issues. It is proudly sponsored by UCLA's Friends of the Semmel Institute and the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital Board of Advisors. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Today's program will run for one hour with the last segment of the pro program reserved for your questions. If you would like to ask either of our speakers a question, we ask that you please type it into the Q&A, which is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We have over 1,500 people registered for this event, so we will do our best to get to as many questions as possible in the time allotted. Today's program is being recorded and will be available for viewing on our website, friendsofsemmelinstitute.org. There you will also find a library of videos from past programs and, a video, and videos from WOW, the Mental Health Summit, a calendar of upcoming Open Mind events and special events, including our Teen Advisory Council's inaugural Gen Z Wellness Summit in person on Sunday, February 25th at UCLA and the Open Mind Film Festival for high school students that will be held in person this year at UCLA and live streamed on Sunday, April 21st. Details again on our website, 
friendsofsemmelinstitute.org. Now, please join me in giving a warm Zoom welcome to Dr. Kay Redfield Jamison. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm really delighted to be back at UCLA um, and particularly pleased to be with uh, Dr. Michael Gitlin, a longtime colleague and a very longtime wonderful friend. I'm, I'm going to just start by reading a few pages from the beginning of my recent book uh, and then by reading a few of the last pages of the book to try and give you an idea of what it is and then uh, obviously turn it over to Dr. Gitlin for the interview and then questions uh, from those of you who may be watching. Uh, my book is about healing the mind and it's, uh, and it's uh, in many ways, a love song to psychotherapy, which is to say it's a love song to psychotherapy done well. Uh, from earliest times to our own, in cave, village, or consulting room, certain individuals, healers, have stood out for being able to ease the suffering of the mourning, melancholic, or mad. Long before we could treat diseases of the brain, and afflictions of the mind, priests and doctors laid on hands, listened, consoled, dispensed potions, and engaged the gods through ritual and magic. Science clearly has progressed. Medications and psychotherapy extend hope that did not exist in earlier times. And for many, modern medicine offers cure. But to treat, even to cure the mind, is not always to heal the mind. This book is about the healing of psychological pain through medicine and psychotherapy. What makes a great healer and the role of imagination and memory in the regeneration of the mind it is about how extraordinary psychotherapy is, done, is when it's done well and how dispiriting it is when it is done badly. It is about human and clinical realities, that healing the mind is, at its heart, a journey into memory, into imagination. It is a quest. It is a journey of accompaniment, and importantly, it is a journey of hard work. Fires in the Dark is more than anything a reflection on healing the mind. It is an archipelago of thoughts, experiences, and images. It is a book that looks back on the ancient, learns from the modern, and tries to discern the common threads and practice of extraordinary healing. It seeks for what the first World War poet, Siegfried Sassoon, wrote about his doctors, Dr. W.H.R. Rivers, the psychiatrist who saw him through the trauma of war. Sassoon wrote, Rivers came in and closed the door behind him. Quiet and alert, purposeful and unhesitating, he seemed to empty the room of everything that had needed exercising. And then a few words from the final bits of the, of the book. I set out to write a book about healing. Instead, I've written more about healers. This was perhaps inevitable. Healers leave their mark. When I was young, mania and depression forced me to seek a doc doctor's help. I was lucky. He was a consummate healer. What matters to you, he asked. How do I understand you? How can I make a difference? Part of getting well was learning about healing from somebody who was so good at it. He knew about clinical he knew clinical medicine well and psychopathology well. And he understood, respected, and took delight in the magnificent oddities of human nature. He took life with the gravity it warrants. He was intelligent in his use of medicine and judicious in his use of expectation. He probed my fears with subtlety, kindness, and persistence. He taught me to expect that getting well would be hard and that there was no way to face madness and despair 
except with courage that I was not sure I had. He was clear that he would be there for a harsh but interesting journey. Along the way, I was to rely upon myself and my better instincts, yet be open to possibility and to other ways of seeing life. It would require that I take real, not token risks. In a hard time, I had to do things I doubted I could do. Drawing upon things I had loved in the past allowed me to reach out to the future. I had been by, advised by my doctor that the work of life and of contending with psychosis and depression would be within my reach. I was told, and it was true, that healing would be hard. I was told as well that the journey would bear benefit of a sort I could not imagine. This too was true. Knowledge accrues, not always without pain, not always without grace. We have a covenant with life to make of it something serious and wonderful. There's a cost for this. And to redeem it, we look to our healers. Thank you. Um, now I'm particularly pleased to turn over uh, this to Dr. Michael Gitlin, who, as I say, is a longtime colleague when I was at UCLA before I moved to Johns Hopkins and a longtime friend and a terrific doctor. Thank you, Kate. Um, I'm so glad to be back here. I'm always honored to participate in Friends events and even more honored to be invited to, to discuss Kay Jamison's book. Um, I wanted to just acknowledge that Kay started the Mood Disorders Clinic in 1978. I joined her in, one year later in 1979. And since she went to Hopkins in the mid eighties, I've been running the clinic by myself essentially. And I wanted to just say that having finished my residency in 79, Kay was at that point, not just my colleague and of course became my friend, but really was my mentor. She introduced me to mood disorders when I was a resident. Really, I was actually much more interested in schizophrenia. Um, and she was gracious and generous enough to introduce me to the giants in the field of mood disorders who came to visit UCLA and to visit Kay, people like Mon Scow, Fred Goodwin, et cetera. So I'm indebted to her for, oh, my career. So what I want to do is I want to focus on the issues in Fires in the Dark, for those of you who have not read it yet. And I want to focus on those issues related to psychiatry. But for those of you who might uh, consider reading it, and I hope that's many of you, please know that this book is far broader and wider ranging than just about psychiatry healers or healing. If you read the jacket cover, you know, the blurbs on the jacket cover, they focus on the healing. But again, the book is much bigger than that. It is, as Kay said, a meditation on courage, on myth, and it gives great, great mini biographies. There's one, not so many, um, on the great Paul Robeson and shorter ones on W.H. Rivers, who Kay alluded to as a psychiatrist in early 20th century England and was the psychiatrist to Siegfried Sassoon, the poet and various other folks. Um, there's a great deal about William Osler, who was a Hopkins physician who essentially invented modern medical education, the way we teach and learn medicine even today, on Sassoon, of course, and a big section on the myth of King Arthur, stuff I actually didn't know about. Anyway, the core of the book, as Kay said, is about healers, and Kay focuses a great deal on this uh, fellow W.H. Rivers, who was a broadly talented and immensely curious polymath, who was the therapist to Siegfried Sassoon and others uh, during World War I. But, but again, Kay rightly places therapists as just the most modern version of healers, and healers have existed for millennia. Formal psychotherapists have not existed for millennia, millennia but healers certainly have. Religious leaders, ministers, priests, rabbis, senseis, and every other ones you can think of in every culture. They've had healers and they've been healers. And as Kay quoted her statement, she set out to write a book about healing 
and instead she's written more about healers. And this also actually shouldn't even be stay as narrow about being about psychotherapy and psychiatry. This fits also with the historical role of the physician. Uh, one of the great, if not the best of our medical historians was a, a Brit named Roy Porter, who's no longer with us. And in one of his very insightful books, he reminded us that even though technically effective treatments in medicine are really only a hundred years old, you think about it, yeah, we knew that foxglove, which was a plant that had digitalis, was available in a few others, but by and large, the ways we actually treat, effectively treat all medical disorders are only a century old, if that. And yet physicians have been in societies for thousands of years. What did physicians do before they had any actual ways of making people better? And according to Porter, they did three things. They healed the sick, and that's what we focus excessively on now, making people better. They minister unto the sick, which is an art that unfortunately gets forgotten about way too frequently, and they provide explanations. What are the explanations that physicians provide? And if you think about it, psychotherapists do this too. Diagnosis, what's wrong with me, doctor? Second, prognosis, what's gonna happen to me? And third, what's called pathogenesis. What is, the, what is happening here? What's going wrong, whether it's the, the black bile or the dark humors or whatever, these are all explanatory systems. This is what healers and physicians have been doing for thousands of years. As Porter says in his book, the prominence of medicine has lain only in small measure in its ability to make the sick well. This has always been true and remains so today. And Kay adds, quote, what, about psychiatrists and therapists, to treat disease as best science allows, to console, to accompany and bear witness, to give hope and to make whole again. And these are what healers do. And again, the issue is, okay, be great if we can cure people, but if we, and we cure them of course, when we can, those of us who try to be healers, but when we can't, we provide solace. In Kay's book, she quotes, this an oath taken by senior residents at Hopkins that in fact was written by Kay's husband, Tom Trail. And the quote is, she quotes her cardiologist husband as, as having written is this oath, I will count my success as physician and teacher by the lives I have touched. And notice, it's not the lives I have cured, it's the lives I have touched. Really signaling the acceptance of that broader view of a physician and a healer. Kay also quotes in the book, an amazing figure of there being 400 different psychotherapies. Oh my goodness. And like religion, I think we should focus on how is it there are so many and so many vigorous proponents of each of them. There's ACT and psychoanalysis and CBT and IPT and whatever letter combinations we can consider. And the, the query should be not how are they all different. In today's world, everybody wants to distinguish their treatment from someone else, someone else's treatment. Even when in psychoanal psychoanalysis, the classical analysts distinguish themselves from the Kleinians and from the self-psychologists. But the better question to ask is, why is it that they all work? Not how are they all different? And Kay focuses on what are the universal elements of psychotherapy. And in that way, she follows on the, in the footstep of, of another Hopkins person, Jerome Frank, who in 1961 wrote an astonishing book called Persuasion and Healing. Uh, and in that book, what Frank talks about is, again, why is it that all therapists work? And that was one of the two most influential books in my professional life. For those who are interested, the other one is Irv Yalom's Existential Psychotherapy. And again, what, what Frank talks about very, very much the way Kay is describing it in her book is that psychotherapy is in a universal way is a relationship between a socially sanctioned healer, a sufferer who needs relief and a relationship between the two. And as they say, the rest is commentary. She also highlights the 
not just of the relationship, but the requires of a healer. In her chapter that focuses specifically on psychotherapy uh, in her book, and the name of the chapter is called Bearings in the Dark, which I love that title. Kay describes what it what makes for a good therapist, and she quotes a 19th century psychologist, or as they were called then, alienists, it turns out. Um, and the quote from this 19th century psychologist was, a sympathizing distress at moral pain and a strong desire to remove it. Again, very simple, very clear, and very profound. And what is necessary is the relationship or as it's technically called the therapeutic alliance, or as I seem to refer to it frequently, the click. The click is a patient meets a potential therapist. How am I gonna know if this is the right person? And I always tell people, you'll know. You'll know because you'll feel this is somebody who can understand me, who might be able to help me, and that predicts success more than any other. The one caveat I would make to that is, I know this is going to come as a shock, but therapists are imperfect beings. And one of the requirements is the comfort or ease that each of us have with specifically the kind of problems one patient or another might have. As an example, I have colleagues who are amazingly comfortable with overtly psychotic people and do incredibly well with patients with schizophrenia. They may not do so well with patients with other disorders. I myself are, I'm very comfortable with the raciness of hypomania. I think it mirrors my histrionic New York energetic style. And I find myself very capable of sitting with depressed people without having their depression infect me. There are some people when they sit with depression, it overwhelms them. And because of those two luckily, lucky gifts that I have, hopefully I'm able to work with people with depression and bipolar disorder because of that. And for others, they're uniquely suited to working with people with trauma, et cetera. Hopefully each of us who is a health professional learns and is insightful enough to be able to say, I do well with these people and not those. Unfortunately, of course, if you work in a, a setting where you are assigned patients, you may not have that, that choice. That's problematic. The last point I want to make is, again, talking a little bit about uh, healing itself. So with Siegfried Sassoon and Rivers, the problem was it, it, that issue had highlighted the problem of trauma. Of course, we're talking about World War I, 1914 through 1918. And these were sensitive souls who went into slaughter fields where the people next to them were maimed and killed and the worst things possible, death, mutilation, destruction. And that same time frame, 1914 to 18, was really the first heyday of psychoanalysis. Uh, Freud had published Interpretation of Dreams a little over 10 years previously, and he was still working in Vienna and writing and formulating, and this idea of the unconscious, that people had motivations that they may or may not be aware of, and repression, that people had feelings that they couldn't, that they didn't know that they had, and that they played a major role in people's psychopathology or troubles, was a central topic. And W.H. Rivers highlighted the requirement that if you're going to work with people who are traumatized, in his case with the war, that you had to be help them look at the memories, both visual and otherwise. But he was also wise enough to know that at the same time, enveloping yourself too much, obsessing about the trauma was detrimental. Last year, there was a book published called Forgetting the Benefits of Not Remembering. And I read it and it highlighted that if we remembered everything, we would be overwhelmed and would be destructive. So the key in psychotherapy in dealing with trauma is finding that optimal middle ground and fires in the dark comes back to that theme repeatedly. The need to find the middle ground, both for the healer who has to have boundaries, right? You get close to patients, but you can't get too close because you, a, it's not cool, and B, you get overwhelmed. And for the sufferer, they need to find a balance between dealing with the trauma 
and not obsessing about it and not getting overwhelmed. These are just a few highlights of the book, and I would urge you to read it because it's, of course, beautifully written, and it, it's a great learning. I learned so much from reading it, and I'm so grateful to Kay for it. So with that, Kay, can you come back, and you and I will chat a bit, and then we'll open up to questions. I've forgotten what a great teacher you are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you just interview yourself? <laughs> uh, no, I'm gonna, I worked on my questions for you, and that's where I'm going. All right, so first, we know that great novelists have come out of almost every war. I actually can't think of one from the Korean War, but Civil War, World War I, Vietnam, there are great novels coming out of it. Yet, the, as you focus on in the book, the flowering of British poets in World War I, Sassoon, Owen, Graves, seems absolutely unusual. Any sense of why World War I was such a fertile ground for, for poets and the, the British poets. It's it's hard to say how much of it is just um, the luck of the draw, as it were. Uh, some of it, I think, was that the British officers were drawn from really highly educated classes. From I mean, it was well known that Oxford and Cambridge just sent out its young men to be killed. And so you had young men who were highly educated in poetry and in classics and literature and so forth. They had some time on their hands. They had, uh, I think, a horrific desire to survive through and make some sense of, of what they were going through in the suffering uh, by what they wrote. But it is, it is a surprising sort of thing because you have perhaps um, more novels coming out of World War II, but I can't think of any instance where you had such extraordinary poetry, uh, uh, just superb exactly. poets. Uh, you know. Right, that's exactly what I what made me think about it. Okay, so your description in the book of the great psychotherapist healers like Rivers and Dan Auerbach describes holistic views of therapists, um, it, really physicians and psychiatrists as healers. And it makes me think of the language that we use today, which my bias is I'm horrified by, which is not of healers and sufferers, but of providers and consumers. Oh, and don't get me started. I mean, I, I shouldn't get you started on that no, no, one. No. When, I, when I have my seminars with the third year residents and they so, every now and then refer to themselves as providers, I say to them, did you grow up thinking you wanted to be a provider? Or did you grow up thinking you wanted to be a doctor? And mm -hmm. if if you know that there's a, a huge placebo effect from the use of language and the use of of mock pills, as it were, uh, why would you why would you turn that over other than sheer raw economic greed? Uh, turn that label over, and I think that that's just uh, you know it's it's like uh, uh, my husband who you referred to um, ha has a slide. That he that says provider Zhivago, you know, it's that somehow Dr. Zhivago loses a bit of of what he was and who he was when you say provider Zhivago. And I think our language makes a difference. It's Orwellian. And right. you know. That's so good. And in your book, by the way, you quote, because it made me think of it, you quote Osler, the great Hopkins physician of hundred years ago. You quote him as saying to the physician in training. You are in the profession as a calling, not as a business. Exactly. And I think that line resonates so much today. Right. Um, also, in and, uh, and and likewise with that, with it being a calling, that ancient link between the priesthood and doctors. You know that there, there's so much of what they did uh, complemented one another, and where one left off, the other began in some respects. And I think that that is is is. True, you know. Absolutely. And in the book, when you're describing what was then called shell shock, which is clearly the forerunner of both acute stress syndromes and post-traumatic stress disorder, again, it made me think that one of the evolutions most recently is that we have really stretched and expanded the boundaries of what we think of as trauma. It started yeah. with 
catastrophes, wars, holocausts, things like that. And now it's broadened greatly even to things like childhood verbal trauma. My parents yelled at me. And on one hand, that can be traumatic for people. On the other hand, I have some concern that when we combine war and Holocaust with being yelled at, we've lost something there. And we should have, as you say, different words, different language to describe what are, I think, stunningly different experiences. What are your well, thoughts? It completely, it completely trivializes trauma. Uh, and it makes a big mush out of everything. It's kind of like saying, do you talk about mental health or do you talk about mental illness? Everything becomes mental health or mental health issue. I mean, at some point you have to say, no, this is almost certainly an illness. Uh, and we're not going to continue saying it's just some sort of aspect of not wellness or wellness or whatever. Um, and likewise, for sure, with trauma, uh, it's not to say that you can't use perhaps some of the same techniques, uh, but it, it's to say that language matters and it, it, it should matter. And we shouldn't trivialize things that are when you've seen in the First World War, your best friend's head blown off and you've survived in the trenches with that head as as Wilfred Owen, one of the great poets, did. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's, that's, that's very, very different from, you know, losing a cat. I mean, yes. It is indeed. One of the issues that I didn't bring up in my remarks, and, and you didn't either, in your book, you refer a great deal to the concept from the Greek times on of work being a core part of therapy. You describe that in the, the retreats, sanitariums, hospitals in World War I, People worked. They worked in the garden. They worked with animals. They did stuff. Right. And even though we have occupational therapy now, that concept seems to have receded enormously in our visions of, of what heals people. What are your thoughts about that? Well, some of it's pragmatic, a pa practical matter, obviously, that the average stay, length of stay in a psychiatric hospital doesn't begin to allow you to even show up at OT at occupational therapy, much less profit from it. Uh, is people have scarcely have time to get a diagnosis and put on an initial regimen of medications, much less uh, do anything with their mind. And, and most people at that point are too sick to really benefit from that. I think um, the concept of, of work being important was was in the everyday life as well. For I think for, for therapists. And for doctors, perhaps in this day and age, to put more of an emphasis on what it is and what does work mean to you and how can you benefit from it and what can we do to make it meaningful? Um, I don't think that um, the kind of set clinical settings that we have now lend themselves um, to actually doing work. But I think, you know, whether you're a poet and you, you, you keep your mind together um, by work or whether you're a farmer and that is what gives you meaning and value and um, economics uh, you know, sustenance, all these things are terribly important. I think we've just sort of gotten away from the notion of how important work is. Right, and that, that I was struck by that reading the book. Um, in the book, of course, it centers on a group of remarkable men and I think for historical reasons, they were all men, Rivers, Osler, the poets, etc. And you talk a great deal about, in, as you say, enlisting imagination in the cause of healing is not new. And you make a very good case for it. My only worry is this was an unusual group of people, both the therapists and the patients, unusually bright, educated, imaginative people. And I worry, what do we do with all those people who may not be so imaginative, who may not be so creative? I think there's a difference between being imaginative and using your imagination. Um, so that people who are creative and who make their way in the world by words or, or music or art, that's one thing. Um, and that's, that can be terribly important. But I think also uh, one of the reasons I focused so much on children's literature is that children's literature is accessible to most people. Um, that um, actually when the women I focus on, in addition to the nurses, 
uh, in the First World War, but is is the writer of uh, Mary Poppins. And she was deeply saturated. Her mind was saturated, her life with, with myth and what myth could do for people and had done for people. And her writings about Mary Poppins are completely mythical in that sense. And I think you can take a young girl or boy and expose them to great literature. They don't have to be the world's most imaginative person, uh, but they do uh, can, can benefit from the imagination of somebody else or to imagine a situation differently. In psychotherapy, we ask people to imagine situations all the time um, to either go back and recollect or to somehow reconstruct or to use those memories totally. to go forward. And you feel the same thing would be true about adults, not just children. Oh, I, I think children's literature is written many times for adults. Absolutely. You know, and I think it's also true. I think that one of the reasons why I focused on courage is courage is not a function of intellect or anything else. It's a function of a particular way of behaving and believing. And we get much of that from our uh, from literature and from examples around us. So the book, it, it focuses on exemplars. It, it focuses on people who were great at what they did. And, um, you know, I, it, so it's, it's just a different focus. I think we learn, I think we've gotten rid of heroes way too much. I think we can learn from heroes from, we've become so jaded and jaundiced and um, splintered that those all those lessons over the thousands of years from Homer on uh, and before, um, we can learn from those things about how to face adversity, pain, suffering, and so forth. Great. Well, thank you. I know we want to leave time for uh, the gang to ask questions. So, Vicki, would you come back and join us and be the keeper of questions? Yes, I would be happy to. Um, but first, I want to, before we go to the questions, I want to thank both of you for this in, enlightening and inspiring conversation and so informative. And um, you gave us a lot to think about. Um, and Kay, I want to warmly thank you for writing this book and all the books that you have written, because you've really changed lives, um, especially the the. The first books, An Unquiet Mind, really opened up many conversations about mental health and mental illness, and you really helped reduce the stigma. So thank you, and thank you for everything that you do, both of you. Um, you are the heroes. You are the superheroes that we learn from. Now to the questions. Um, the first question we have is about addiction disorders and how are they closely, how and why are they closely related to bipolar and other mood disorders? Um, well, maybe 60% of people who have the more severe forms of mood disorder, of bipolar illness, have a uh, an addiction or an abuse problem with alcohol and or drugs. Um, I think the sense is some of it is sometimes those both run in families and the hereditary component to both bipolar illness, of course, and to some of the addictions. Also that people may self-medicate. Uh, there, you know, there are all sorts sorts of reasons that, um, you know, they, they might co-vary. Uh, but there's no question that it's, that, it's, that it's a significant problem and that both of those issues have to be addressed separately and together. Thank you. Dr. Gitlin, did you want to add anything? I, I would just want to remind everyone that, yeah, even though people with bipolar disorder are at higher risk for addictive disorders, that's also true about many other psychiatric disorders, ADHD, anxiety disorders, etc. cetera. So it, it is not a unique link. Thank you. Okay, the next question we have, you mentioned the value of a good psychotherapist, a good healer. This process seems tediously and frustratingly slow. How does one find a good psychotherapist where none seem to be accessible to those of low income and need? That's a big question. Oh, uh, well, yes, it is. I mean, it's a, it's a huge problem. I mean, I, I would start with the political, uh, which is to say we have a completely broken healthcare system that makes no pretense of 
equitably serving people with mental illness. So it's it's very hard to say, you know, I, I can say, well, this is an exemplary way of doing psychotherapy. I believe that's an important thing to do because I think it's important for people to see that can be done. But I know Dr. Gitlin knows, every, everybody knows who, who does this for a living, uh, that there aren't nearly enough psychiatrists or psychologists or social workers. Um, and also there aren't nearly enough competent ones. So, you know, I, I'm focusing here on um, the qualities of a good healer. One of the things that I also try to make clear is that those things are of no avail if you're not competent. And there is a shortage of, of competent and compassionate healers. You know, that just is true. And so if you say, how can I even begin to um, get treatment? The question is, it's really hard. You know, I mean, I, there's, I don't think it's easy to say. If you haven't got money in this country, um, your access to psychotherapy is going to be pretty limited. I'm just going to bring up one teeny little silver lining in the very dark cloud that Kay, that Kay described, which I agree with. Our more recent medical students and residents at UCLA, at least, because those are the ones I know, of course, many more of them compared to, let's say, 20 years ago, have come in with a clear commitment to wanting to, to work with underserved populations. That wasn't true 20 years ago. And it is, I interviewed two residency applicants today, and both of them have already demonstrated um, in their work with nonprofits and things like that, that they're not just looking to go out and, you know, treat rich folks. And I, that's really impressive. And I, I don't disagree with anything Kay said, the health system is broken, but there are at least little bits of silver linings. Thank you, Dr. Gettlin. I know UCLA is very focused on um, diversity in their residency program and training people of um, minority cultures so that they can go into their communities and and help them help people in their communities. And it, it's it's as you say, it's a silver lining that's starting to come about. Um, it's going to take a while, though. Okay, as a parent and an educator, I have trouble understanding parents that won't avail their children of medical and or therapeutic options to aid their children. How can an educator approach them without causing a defensive reaction? Um, I, I think, you know, one thing is I, I I th I'm a great believer in reaching out for consultations from with one's colleagues, you know, and if if you have a concern uh, to talk about it with other people, how do I broach this is this is the concern I have I'm, I don't want to offend somebody I don't want to put them off I don't want to scare them off, uh, alienate them, you know, how have you found it effective to do because I think people learn from other people, how to sometimes figure out really difficult situations. It's hard because I think teachers are put in a position in this day and age of having to do everything. And I think it's unreasonable. You know, I think it's unreasonable to ask teachers and educators to be therapists, uh, to be screeners. You know, it's one thing to to see something that is really deeply, deeply concerning. It's another thing to say, you've got a class full of 30 kids and you're supposed to respond to everybody's psychological concerns and particularly kids who come from very difficult backgrounds. You know, um, I, th I think that it's, it's, it's uh, the sort of thing we don't give enough talk to and, and discussion about, but maybe Mike has some ideas. And, and maybe we make up for it even, this is sarcasm, by then not even paying them well as we ask them right. to do multiple impossible jobs and right. don't pay them what they're worth because they're so vital in our society. Yeah. I think th one of the things that I was struck by Harvard uh, quite a few years ago now uh, was facing a lot of complaints about their mental health services, their counseling service. And they, to their credit, got an outside review and asked, what are we doing wrong? And 
people were very willing to tell Harvard what they were doing wrong and co- and actually coming up with, with some good ideas. And what they, they found was that the professors were feeling like they had to solve the problem. If a, if a student came into their classroom during office hours and broke down and started crying, uh, was it somehow they were responsible to make them feel better? And what, this, uh, what the suggestion was, was here are telephone numbers. If this is an emergency situation. This is what you do. These are how you point people in the right direction. But you can't feel like you are obligated to solve the problem because it's un- it's unrealistic and it really puts people off. Uh, so I, I think that that's one thing. Uh, Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions about trauma. Um, how and you spoke about trauma from war. Um, we're living through a, a war time right now. We're a new generation of young people are going to have trauma and live with trauma. What about generational trauma? Um, so the uh, children of Holocaust survivors say, what can you comment on that? You know, I would be beyond um, my understanding and education and clinical training to answer that. Um, It would be presumptuous, I think, of me to to begin to answer that. I think all you can say is that there must be good support groups, uh, uh, you know, talk with rabbis, friends who are rabbis and so forth. But I think that that's, that's such an awful sort of and specific set of issues that it, as I say, it would be presumptuous for me to um, to say that I had any insight into that because I don't. I, I mean, I can only empathize. Yeah, and I think the only thing to acknowledge in this setting is that that's a new concept, and I think a very valid one. I have worked with enough children; they're now in their fifties and sixties of Holocaust survivors, and there is some unnerving commonality in some of the difficulties they have. And based on the way their parents had to deal with unimaginable traumatic events before my patients were born, because my patients were all born in their 50s and 60s, and their parents were obviously in the camps or in hiding in the the 30s and 40s. And it's a remarkable thing. We just need more work on it. And I think I agree with Kate, neither she nor I are experts on that. Thank you. Um, what advice would you give someone who um, has a diagnosis of a mood disorder and refuses treatment? That's I would say you, that's, yeah, I would say that's you know there are two major problems, particularly with bipolar illness, um, the clinical problems. One is getting people into treatment that need treatment and resist and deny and so forth. And the other is once people are in treatment, um, encouraging them to stay on their treatment program, namely generally medication. And I think, you know, it's it's one of the hardest things you can do. Uh, If somebody is saying, you know, particularly if they're mildly manic, for example, uh, they've got a lot better things to do with their lives than to go and see a doctor when they're feeling better than they've ever felt in their lives. It's completely counterintuitive to show up at a doctor's. Sometimes you can do what you would might do with um, addictive uh, situation where you would have an intervention and you would get friends and colleagues or you know religious figures, whatever, to get together and say, "Look, we're really concerned about you. Uh, be very specific about what you're concerned about and uh, and so forth. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. but it's it's very hard, you know. It's 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 not the sort of thing that's conducive to um, rational persuasion. Um, you know, so, sometimes people just have to be hospitalized, uh, whether they, you know, agree to it or not. And uh, sometimes they just have to get to the bottom, like with alcohol or with drugs. Uh, and it's it's painful to watch, and you just want to say. You know, please, 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 you know, 
Um, but it, it do doesn't always work out that way. But, you know, I mean, a lot of people do. I mean, I think what I'm encouraged about in this day and age, I spent a lot of time on college campuses because of the age of onset of mood disorders. And people are, are much better educated about depression, particularly, but also bipolar illness. And they know the symptoms. And if they don't have it themselves, they recognize it in someone else. And they're much more inclined to reach out, I think, uh, than they used to be. And at the risk of sounding defensive for uh, defensive of myself and my fellow psychiatrists, we are unnervingly easy to fool. I can't tell you the number of times I find out a patient of mine stopped their meds months before and the family said, how could you not know? And the answer is, because how could I know? We're really easy to fool. You think that we can look at people and know those things? Mm-mm. But in some situations, too, I think you can make you can change the gradient of of outcome for what the consequences. So, for example, at Hopkins with the medical students, uh, we tell them every year, look, a lot of you are going to get depressed. It's a really common illness. Uh, this you're at the age risk period for it. Um, and we will do everything possible to get you well. Uh, and we have every reason to believe you will get well. It's a very treatable illness. But what we cannot tolerate is impaired doctors. Uh, we it, it's just it's, it's just not. So you want to encourage people to get treatment rather than to suffer in silence uh, or avoid treatment because of, in the case of medicine and, and, and many other professions, uh, because of the consequences for licensing and so forth. You want to make it easy for people and you want to reach out and you want to encourage them, uh, the students, to reach out to other people if they see similar problems. Dr. Gitlin? I have nothing to add to that. Perfect. Yeah. Um, to that, do you think now that this next, this uh, Gen Z generation is more open to talking about mental health issues that they face and more supportive of one another. We started a teen advisory council, the friends did, and we're seeing that in this group of young people that, that joined the council. And I'm wondering if that you might comment on that. Um, yes and no. I think by and large, people are, are again, I think much better educated than they used to be. One of the few good things to come out of the pandemic is that everybody's talking about it. and and parents were cooped up with kids who ordinarily were able to escape the scrutiny of their parents. So their parents had no idea before how, how sick or how much suffering the kids were going through. And I think that that's opened up the conversation. It's also uh, opened up the conversation about, again, how broken the healthcare system is. Um, I think that there's there's a sort of an innate discrimination against certain kinds of mental illness, and that's that's perhaps less so than it used to be. But it, it's also true if you're at a college um, and everybody around you is physically healthy and seemingly mentally healthy, and they're running around and they're concentrating and they're reading and things are easy for them. Um, it's it's terribly difficult to deal with that, and and sometimes other students are really understanding and supportive, and sometimes they're not. And so if you've got behavior, like when you're manic, that is very disruptive uh, and damaging to other people, it, it's not the sort of thing that brings out a lot of natural sympathy. But I, I do think people are, are, are better educated and kinder. Yeah, I would concur, and it clearly predates the pandemic. Um, you know, the young people, we, we were, those of us of an older generation, uh, lived in a world more of narrow views of what's acceptable. And there was much more, frankly, repression. Uh, and now things are more open in terms of all sorts of things, including the acceptance that, you know, the brain is an organ that sometimes doesn't feel well, like lungs and pancreases and, and hearts. And you just, you go take care of it. And I'm thrilled when I see that with younger people. It's much harder, I think, with the older folks like us. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> um, it's a generational thing, right? Um, you you mentioned the 
uh, importance of work. And we have a couple of questions here about what one is about the ideal work-life balance and uh, the meaning of, of work for, for healing. And would you recommend if somebody doesn't have uh, paid work that they volunteer to fill that need? Um, I can't address the work-life va balance so much. Uh, I think it's, it's the sort of thing, actually, it's a good psychotherapy issue, really, because it's it's terribly individual. I mean, some people are anxious and fraught if they're not working. Uh, some people have a low tolerance for work. I mean, people, it's a, it's a kind of a very uh, widely varying sort of uh, desire. But I think what you can do is you can encourage people to talk about work, what it means to them. What it means to them if, for example, they've been depressed and they've met, they've they're behind or they feel like they aren't having difficulty uh, catching up with it. How can you be helpful in le letting them look at those things and and making things up? Um, I think those things are are perhaps useful. Um, I think that for sure things like volunteer. I mean, I don't think work has to be the sort of thing where you're just you're getting paid for what you do. I mean, a lot of writers, for example. Uh, work is an essential part of their lives, but they don't necessarily get paid for it. It's not a lot of work, um, and certainly volunteer work can be enormously gratifying to people and very useful to people, um, but obviously people don't get paid by definition. I, I, I concur completely. I mean, we, I all the time talk to my patients and patients in the mood clinic I mean, the magic word is structure. You know, I agree, work-life balance is too individual, but just sitting around is probably not good for people. And again, in uh, in Kay's book, she talks a lot about quoting the Greek physicians or the Greek healers, maybe is more appropriate. They were absolutely sure that people needed to be active and busy when they were mentally ill. And I think that is a great tradition and doesn't matter whether you're working, going to school, volunteering or whatever, but there is, there is benefit to structure and activity. And I'll add, there's a sense of community that you, you meet new people and takes you to, a, you know, have new relationships and, and common, common interests in the volunteer work, which I'm a volunteer, so I will testify to that. Um, we have time for one more question, and it's actually not a question. There are several people that are expressing their gratitude to you, Dr. Jameson, for uh, one one of our viewers think, says she credits you saving her life when you wrote The Unquiet, An Unquiet Mind. Uh, as does uh, another one of our viewers. And I will add to that, that I, which I said earlier, I think you have, were one of the first, a pioneer in opening up discussions and opening up uh, to the public about your own, your own bipolar disorder and helping normalize that to millions of other people who live with an illness of the mind or brain. So with extreme gratitude to you and to you, Dr. Gitlin, for sharing your vast, vast knowledge and always saying yes to being a part of a Friends of Semmel um, program. So we are just very, very grateful. Um, thank you everybody for the privilege of your time and joining us for this open mind. And we hope to see you on December 13th, when a very hot topic will be social media and teens. And our special guest will be Dr. Devorah Heitner, who is the author of Growing Up in Public, in conversation with Dr. Yalda Yules, who is the founder of Scholars and Storytellers at UCLA. So I hope to see you all there. Um, for those of you who celebrate, happy Hanukkah. This is the first night of Hanukkah. So, um, and uh, good night, stay well, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for inviting us. Bye. Go Bruins.